Hello, my name's Dennis, and welcome to Adventures in One Love. Today, we want to bring you a podcast-style video that Lydia was able to film with Carlos Hilario. Carlos is no stranger to us at One Love United. He was did some of the groundbreaking work for media with our ministry before I came on, and he continues to help us out with different filming locations, helping us with video and editing support, and we're just so grateful to him for all the service that he's done. He was also gracious enough to allow us to repost the video that he's doing for his own channel as they talk to Gus Rodriguez and his wife about their testimony and the ministry that they're doing. We know you're going to love it. Stay tuned. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you. And this is our first podcast for The Words in Red. So before we start, I just want to uh, introduce my co-host, Lydia King. I'm very grateful for you being here. Lydia, can you tell me a little bit about, about you? Thank you. I love doing this with you. We've been... Um, we have a great history with Adventures in One Love, so we have our YouTube channel. I am the executive director of One Love United. We are a missional organization, so that means both online and we're called to the Caribbean and to the Caribbean diaspora. And really, our heart is to let people know whatever you have in your hand. That's what God is asking for. And so wherever we are, with our, if, it, if the Lord is calling us to miss, be a missionary to our kids' school or to the grocery store, then that's what we, we will do. So I'm so excited for this conversation with you, Gus and Marjorie, because you really have done that. Whatever you have in your hand, you've given it to the Lord. So I'm excited to see what the Lord reveals in this conversation. Amen. That's awesome. So with that said, uh, man, I'm, I'm excited about what we're about to hear. Um, so let me introduce Gus and his wife, Marjorie. Thank you so much for, for coming out here and spending a little time with us. Uh, this really means a lot to me. Um, Gus, uh, you want to uh, tell me a little bit about how long you guys been married? You, you remember? <laughs> <laughs> long time? He said Gus. I love how they look at each <laughs> other. Like. We've been together uh, since 2004. Uh, we officially got married 2010. And kids? You have kids? Yes. I have six total, and me and her, we Hold have up. four. You got six in ages? 30, <laughs> 26, 19, 17, 15, and eight months. Wow. That is awesome. <laughs> Love it. I really, really pray that we get to have another opportunity to hear more about your testimony because those ages and then eight months, there's some miracles that the Lord has been I, doing. I would really like to listen to my kids talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> How many live with you? Let's, let's start with that. Four. Four. <laughs> what do you count? You know, it's like a, you're going <laughs> to get that visual yeah, image in your mind. So you guys have a ministry together, huh? Yes. yes. What's the name of your ministry? The ministry's name is called New Creation in Christ, a ministry of reconciliation based out of Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 to 21. Amen. So, so what do you guys do? What's your vision? What do you guys do? Uh, we you preach guys on the streets. We go into the hoods. Uh, we preach in front of Walmarts, Dollar Generals. Uh, we go to uh, juvenile facilities, state prisons, county jails. Uh, we preach repentance, salvation. Just letting everybody know that they need to be reconciled back to God through Jesus Christ. Amen. That's awesome. And I, <clears throat> that's funny because I know you mentioned prisons, right? And um, I know that kind of has part in how we met. Many years ago, we met, how many years ago? About 2017, 16, somewhere around there. Yeah. You were, uh, when I first started filming, you were the first person that I filmed a testimony on. And um, that kind of changed the directory of what, and how I did things from there on. So many years later, I know we were talking a little yeah. bit ago, you said five years ago you were here and none of this was here. So that's awesome. Well, we met them in Ocala when we went to interview mm -hmm. you guys. We, was, right. we went there. Yeah. And that was even, the, uh, the ambulance, it felt like it was just all lit up just for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted, you know, to start my own ministry with, with my wife. You know, mm -hmm. I, just, I knew that we had a calling. She didn't know it. She didn't want no part of it, uh, but uh, you know things change, huh? <laughs> God Big had time. a plan. So you guys do something together. Uh, I think it's dropped the amount of time that you do it a week. What do you guys do together in the morning? You guys go the online. The cup of coffee. Yeah. yeah. Tell me. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Well, the cup of coffee came with an idea of a friend of ours that he used to do the morning cup of joe, mm -hmm. and and I told him. 
through a difficult, difficult time that we were having, why don't we do something like that so that we can connect a little bit and um, speak about God that can minister to us at the same time. And we started doing it. And along, we started doing it and doing it. We had like more viewers and, and more people getting to, to our videos and stuff. And it, and it was a way of keeping us a little more together. I okay. love that it was in a time that you guys were facing difficulty personally, mm -hmm. that you're like, okay, let's serve. Let's use what we have and let's do this together and find an, a mutual place of connection. And I think people forget that we're bringing our raw selves, our real selves to the table when we are, we're ministering. It's not like, okay, I'm a different person when I minister. Mm -hmm. And so I love that it's, we need to be authentic. I think marriages are struggling. And so it's important. And I love that you guys share openly that in times of, of trouble and times of struggle, we go to the Lord Amen. and he meets us there. So I, I love that. Amen. Tell me, tell me where your story be started. Tell me about your past. Uh, my story began in Miami. I was born and raised in, in Miami, Florida. Yeah, I know. You like that coffee. You like that. <laughs> that, that yeah. You be drinking that coffee all the time. That's I love the it. That's cup of coffee. Yeah, yeah. the Cuban coffee. Yeah. yeah. Um, at the age of 13, uh, I, I got on that broad road. Mm. That the Bible speaks about that brings death and destruction. Uh, you know, at, at that age, you don't, you don't see, uh, you know, what could happen when you walk down that road. Uh, during that time in Miami, there was a lot of gangs, you know, in, in different parts of Miami in the cities. And, you know, I decided to join a gang, which later I'll become one of the leaders of the gang. <clears throat> at the age of 15, I became a father. Mm -hmm. That right there should have just, you know, lit up that bulb in my head to change. And it didn't. Six months after he was born, I got arrested for attempted murder for shooting a rival gang member. Mm -hmm. uh, got tried as an adult. Uh, got placed. A year and a half later, after being on house arrest, I got placed on, on probation. Uh, so, hold on, Gus. So, when you went through that moment in your life, how, I mean, what went through your mind? Like, I know that must have been a scary moment. Like, when that took place and you got arrested, what went through your mind? Like, You know, my, my mind wasn't on, oh, I couldn't go to prison for a long time. You know, it was like, I was like, you know, whatever. It was, it was just part of it. Right. Yeah, I was found guilty. Oh, of attempted uh, murder. Yeah, I went to court for about a year and a half. Okay. And uh, you were you were locked up this whole time while you were going to court or you were out? No, no, I, they had let me out on house arrest eventually. Right. Okay. Uh, you know, I could just go to school and then I had uh, like a little part-time job. But I got placed on 10 years probation. I had to do a bunch of anger uh, control uh, classes. Did they help? No. No. I continued on with that lifestyle, mm. and you know it was only by God's grace that that uh, you know I didn't end up shooting anybody else. Cause though you know in a gang there's other shootings, you know uh, you get involved in gang fights and 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 robberies. At, at that age, I was doing you know some real <coughs> stupid things that could have you know cost me my life, sent me to prison for life. Uh, five years later, after three violations. The judge had enough, and he said, I'm, I'm going to give you what you want. You know, you said that the judge said he gave you what you want. I think that's a really, what did you feel about that statement? Yeah, I mean, every time I went before him, you know, he was like, here you are again, you know. Mm -hmm. they, I, cause I was placed in, in halfway homes when I would violate. I would go to these halfway homes and, and, and leave. You know, after a month or two there, either there were other gang members that were there, and we get into a fight, they kick us out. I just didn't, you know, want to stay there the, the, the months that they gave me to stay there. Mm. So, you know, I'll go back to court. They would reinstate me. But after the third violation, I was, I was at, uh, I was 19. And he said, I'm going to give you what you want. And so you don't want to, you know, o obey my rules and obey the system. Mm. So uh, they wanted to give me 22 years in prison. Mm. Now, then when, when he said that then, when I was mm. 19, like reality that sunk woke in. Up. Yeah, it mm. woke me up. And I was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. And, you know, and then, you know, when I heard my mom, you know, yell, mm. you know, from crying when, mm. you know, that's that, hard. 22 yeah. years, man. That's, yeah, I can't even imagine. That. You're thinking life is over at yeah. that point, right? So uh, they lowered it to seven. It was, it was a plea deal. So I went ahead and took the seven. Okay. And went to prison. Tell me about that first night. 
for tell well, me a little bit oh, about yeah, that. Yeah, when I when I went to the I, I went to the county, I, I turned myself in. I was on the run. Okay. Uh, I turned myself in, and after they sentenced me, I got sick for about a week. You know, just thinking about the whole ordeal. Mm. Uh, you know, but then you know, reality sunk in, and you know, you hear all these stories about prison. And you know, I had friends that went to prison, and I was like, well, you know, now it's time to turn into a savage. Mm. Mm. More than what you already were. Exactly. In prison, I, I, I got involved with a prison gang, which eventually I would become the leader of it in the state of Florida. And, uh, you know, I got placed in confinement for a lot of gang activity. Uh, we, I would get transferred to other prisons. You know, it was only by God's grace that I, that I made it out of prison. I got out December 2001. At what point did, did you come into the picture, Marjorie? It was in 2004. 2004? So when you first met him, how was how what was, was your attitude? Yeah, yeah, what, what was, was your impression? impression? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, we didn't we didn't really meet met to like we just met. It was like I went to pick up somebody and he was there and just somebody introduced us and stuff like that. But like we weren't like he wasn't looking at me or I wasn't looking at him. So at what point did that change? Um, I had come from Puerto Rico from like a, lo a whole bunch of problems that I have over there. And I was a point in my life that I didn't want to know about any guy, about anything. Like I was telling God, guide me in the right way. Um, I got to my sister's house and um, all my sister used to do was go to church, go to the ladies group, go to the kids groups, go all every single group in the church. So I have to like tag along with her. So I didn't have any other option. And that kind of set me up to believe that God wanted something stronger mm. with me. Mm. So I was in that mentality that I wanted to really know what God had for me. And then I met him, but um, I wasn't really looking at him as the next, like the, the next person I'm gonna have in my life or anything like that. But that changed uh, another day that I saw him again and like we started talking about our common life or whatever he has been through and whatever I've been through and stuff like that. And we kind of click. How did you, because I mean, I love that your ministry really is based on that. It is a reconciliation with the Lord and he's the only one who can renew our minds. When did you allow the Lord to really become the, the renewer of your mind? Uh, when I went to a youth challenge in 2006, uh, when I met when I met Marjorie, I was at a, I got into uh, drug dealing, drug trafficking, and at that at that age, I started using a lot of drugs and drinking a lot. Uh, my first marriage it was it was, I mean it, it was already a mess from before I went to prison. Mm. You know I was out there in the streets selling drugs and doing drugs. I always tell people she's the angel that God sent to me at the right time. Amen. You know, and uh, you know, she came from a very abusive relationship in Puerto Rico, and she was into witchcraft. She gave her life to the Lord, and she used to always talk to me about Jesus. And I told her, I don't want to hear about Jesus. <laughs> Jesus ain't real. And uh, you know, her it's like good and evil under one roof. Her life was school for her career in church, and my life was the streets, the strip clubs, getting high, making money. She was acting like a clown. And, uh, you know, in, in 2005, when she was going to give birth to our son, Justin, was when I had that overdose in the hospital. You, when she was, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, when, when she was about to give birth, you weren't there with her? I made it there on time. You made it there on time. I was in so, Alabama for about three days, selling so, drugs and doing drugs. I was high on heroin and cocaine and pills, and she told me, go home and get some rest. So I went back to my house. I don't know how long I was gone, but I continued consuming more drugs and alcohol. And I made it back to the hospital with an ounce of heroin in my pocket that I was going to sell to somebody that was going to meet me at the hospital. Mm. And then as soon as I got to the room, I laid down and right there was where I took my last breath. Mm. If you've made it this far in the video, obviously you're enjoying it. So be sure and hit the like button and subscribe to our YouTube channel and maybe share it with someone you know because that helps us grow and I know you want to help us do that. Let's get back to the video. 
And you're in the hospital as she's delivered your son. Yeah, she had she had already had him. Wow. So you're recovering. Um, he he basically died next to my bed. I um have just woken up because he like when he made it there, I said okay, so now I'm gonna sleep so he can take care of the baby. So I just woke up and I looked to the side and and I called his name and he wouldn't respond to me. So I got up from the bed, I got the baby, and when I looked at him, he like throw up, but he was like, um, choking on his own throw up, like mm. he wouldn't like move or anything, yeah. and that's when I start like reacting. Something is going on. Something is going on. So um, I kept on shaking him, and he wouldn't respond. I took everything from his pockets, everything that he had, and like immediately I called the nurse. So that's so interesting. The forethought that you have that mentality of like to still protect him and to like make you're still looking out for him, like, of course, for his life, but also for the future mm -hmm. by making sure he had no drugs on him. That's incredible. So what happens when you wake up from a drug overdose? So they they they, they hit me with the paddles and, you know, the nice support for three days. The doctor was telling her to pull the plug, call his family he's like wow. to make it. So, uh, you know, I mean. I think about it now, obviously her, her faith in the Lord was, you know, what kept her, you know, believing in, in, in that miracle. And then uh, that's actually where she met my mother because I didn't speak to my mom for about two, three years. Wow. So she had to call my mom and give her the news. And and then when I woke up, everybody, everybody that, was in the room. So that was the first time you met his mom? Yeah, because, yeah. like, my life went so hard, like, before that, that I told him, if you don't talk to your mom, it's okay. I don't. I don't need to meet her. Like I don't care about mm -hmm. like having a relationship with her. Like I'm done. I was so done with everything that I didn't care about it. And then that happened, and we have to like, you know, meet the family. Yeah, through family. that situation. Wow. Wow. Wow, girls. I <laughs> I don't have any words. That's yeah. During that time, I didn't talk to a lot of my family. Mm. You know, because of my, my destructive behavior, you know, people just, they lost hope. You know, people just really didn't want to know about me. Well, after three days, uh, you know, the Lord breathed it into me and gave me life, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the more he breathed it into Adam. You know, when I mean, get, he gave me new life, like I didn't have no withdrawals. Mm. I was brand new. I, I took that breath for granted. Uh, I would walk out of that hospital and continue on with that lifestyle for a whole year. Wow. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I, was, I was back on the highway trafficking dope and, you know, shooting dope into my veins and popping pills and drinking and, uh, you know. I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I say this to be really honest and I know it's a hard question, but like, were you trying to end your life? Were you trying to kill yourself? There were times where I felt like, you know, just ending it all. You know, I, I remember one time vividly I left from the house and. And uh, I walked to to the supermarket around around the corner and just went to the into the bathroom and, and tried to shoot up a gram of heroin mm. just to see if I could just end it all. Wow. Because bef before before that in my life I was always about you know making money, hanging out, but I I came to a, a time in my life where I had to do drugs just to just to function. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was just I was tired of it. I actually, we locked, she, me and her, we came to an agreement to, to lock in myself into the house. And the house that we lived in, we had bars on the windows and the doors. So for five days, all I did was walk from room to room, no sleep. To detox. To detox. Cold wow, you did it by yourself. Cold turkey. Well, the Lord, we know the yeah, Lord the was, Lord, man, man, the Lord has had his hand in your yeah. life miraculously. No suboxone, no methadone. Wow. You know, just crying out to, to a God who I didn't believe in. You know, and, and I know what it is to hear demonic voices. Demonic voices do exist and see shadows. And, uh, you know, I can remember hearing voices. Mm -hmm. Just like we're talking, you're not going to make it. There, Jesus doesn't exist. And, uh, you know, for five days, all I did was just walk back and forth, throwing up. Then that's where uh, I met a pastor named Bobby Rosario. Who uh, He told me his testimony. When I heard his testimony, I said, man, I want that same Jesus hmm. that you serve. Because he was an ex. He was one of the original Land Kings from Chicago. Uh, he was a musician for the Fania All-Stars. He, he sold dope, did dope, and he gave his life to the Lord. And he was pastoring for about 40 years. 
And I, you know, I started going, to, I gave my life to the Lord. I accepted him as my Lord and Savior. I started going to church. But I would go into the bathroom and get high. I was still struggling. So I would go into the bathroom of the church, get high, and then go listen to the message. Huh. Spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. Of course. I, I just want to say I love that everybody doesn't speak the same language. You know, when we go through things, and God doesn't waste anything, even the devastating parts. And you've used the language that you know. You didn't, like, leave that community and, like, go... You know, I was just joking with him earlier. It's not like the Lord said to go be a ski instructor, right? Like he, he kept you in the same, you know the language, you know the struggles, and you're using that now to help other people. I mean, I, I just want to honor the fact that you are actively pouring yourself out for the same people that you needed. You are what you needed. So how does that look now? Oh, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I never... When I gave my life to the Lord, I, it was just, my mindset was just to get clean, you know, go to church, you know, see if, if the Lord will restore my marriage, which he did. Uh, but I never saw myself, you know, going back into the jails and prison to preach. I never saw myself as a preacher. When I never saw new creation in Christ or us doing ministry together. So now that you are, you are in the church, and usually once we get saved, we first need to find out, is God real? Right. And that's that was the quest. And then it's OK, let me clean up the outside. Let me get through with some of these things. But when do you get the call to ministry to actually know that God has a plan? He's going to use everything that you guys have been through. We we're going to church and stuff, but I don't, we didn't see ourselves getting into ministry or the call till about 2015. It was through a, a gift from Angel Tree. It's an organization that, give, that gives gifts to kids. So he told the, the the Department of Correction, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, that he had kids and he wanted to send gifts to our kids. Mm -hmm. So we had to go to a church to get the gifts. So I think it was like 2014. Something like that. 2000, 2014, on Christmas Day, we went to this church. And at this time, we weren't going to church. Mm -hmm. like we, you know, we strayed away. And uh, but during this time, we were like, man, we need to get back to church. You know, the, God has something big for us. And uh, we went to church. Every everybody that came to get their gifts got their gifts and left. Our gifts weren't there. They were still waiting for the lady to bring the the gifts. Hmm. So we had to stay there. And the and the in my mind, I already knew what time it was. God was going to start talking to us. <laughs> so the preacher started preaching, and and you know, the word just. It was smacking me in the face. So then we uh, we started going to church there. That's Pastor Eddie, the, yeah. the gentleman. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Ain't, ain't that crazy how that works, yeah. how, how God just changes uh, the, the situation or what we think we're going to be expecting and just kind of say, no, wait wait a minute. It's not the way you think. It's like this. Yeah. And it what, just opens your mind. What's to, funny is that I told him, this is going to be in a church. We have to go and pick up the gift. That's a setup. <laughs> like I know <laughs> that we're going to go there and they're going to tell us their service and then we're going to have to stay. I was a little upset because I didn't want anything to do with church at that point. I was like upset with the church that I had been going through be to before. And then I wasn't, it was, a, it was I think Christmas Eve, right? Yeah, or New Year's? Christmas Eve. And uh, I wasn't dressed. I, like I have to take shower and get dressed and, and I wasn't dressed at all. He was all nice and pretty and I wasn't. So I'm like, it's my time to get dressed. And he's like, no, let's go there first. We're going to go get the gifts and we leave. And I said, we're going to, this is a setup. It's a church. They're going to trap us there. They're going to want us to stay <laughs> to listen to the message and all that. And it was just like I told him. But did it feel like a good setup? Yes, it was. Because it was. sometimes we need to we need to be we need to be put in those positions that even though we don't want it, it's what's best for mm -hmm. us. Right. Like we knew we had a calling over our lives, but you know that flesh and that and that, mm. and, that, and that struggle, you know, and then, and then that was like the divine appointment where we knew okay. I, I'm just <clears throat> I'm a little curious. The first time you stepped onto the street, how did that feel? Because I, I know we had a, a brief conversation before mm -hmm. we did this about how I would probably react to something like that. But to you, it was very natural. 
it's it just flows from your mouth man so how was that first time did you were you nervous not really no not really God i just, mean you always get them butterflies yeah uh one incident we, we we were preaching at walmart and there was a pastor who was driving from out of town he just he stopped in that parking lot to pray mm. and he said lord i need to hear a word mm. and he just mm-hmm. started he started hearing he started he he, he was hearing this over, over the mic wow and when he turned around and saw us he walked over to us and gave us an offering and he was like man i needed to hear that word amen we've been kicked out yeah, we've been kicked out by the cops. <laughs> mm. Yeah, make sure you include yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, hey. <clears throat> of the parking lot, kicked out of parking lot? Yes. Yeah. With police. Yeah. The police. Oh, wow. Yeah. They just didn't want to hear it. Right. So good. And we, you know, we prayed for them. and That hasn't stopped you, though. No. Yeah. We said, Amen. before we leave, we got to pray for you. And we prayed for them. <laughs> they allowed you to pray? Yeah. That's wow. awesome. Wow, amen. That's awesome. So at one po- at some point, you had the opportunity to uh, step foot back into the jail, into a prison setting. Did that bring back any memories for you? Any, it sure any did. flashbacks? It sure did. That opportunity came up. I was visiting an inmate that I was incarcerated with at Lake CI. Okay. Uh, I came out. I was already going to Coleman. I came out in a magazine called Victorious Living yeah. Magazine. He saw me in that magazine. He was actually one of my right-hand mans in, 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 in Tallahassee. Mm. We're in Tallahassee. Was he shocked? Yeah, he was shocked. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, he's serving a life sentence. And then uh, I went to visit him and he told mm-hmm. me, man, you, you know, we, we need you to come here. The first time you went back into a, a incarcerated setting, were you with him? No, I was totally no. against it. You were against it? Why? I I was going through some some attacks and I was like, blaming him because he was taking part paying attention to other people and not to his family and I will like constantly tell him your first ministry is the family first yeah. la 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 and you're like leaving us to talk to other people you like missing the kids like you missing um this and this and the house you know and like I was against it like totally against it mm. what changed your heart um it was that first time that he like made me go to one of the jails. It was a juvenile prison, and uh, I didn't want to go, so I went. And uh, they all shared their testimonies and stuff. And there was a kid that was like acting up, in the like in the during our part, he was like acting up and trying to be a clown. And I was just seeing my son mm. and that kid. Mm. And I and like I stood up and I said, "Listen, I know you're going through like a lot of things. You don't have to act like this. Mm. You want us to pray for you or whatever. Like things like that happening. If you keep on acting like that, you're not gonna get too far." So like I was talking to him as a mom. Then um like at the moment I was really nervous and I started to praying and praying and praying and um. All of them had their part, and one of the kids stood up and said, "Well, wait, we haven't listened to you, like we haven't listened to your testimony." And like I started looking at everybody, and I said, "Oh no, I didn't, I, 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 I didn't came to I never to talk gave to it. you." <laughs> and he's like, "But I want to listen to your testimony. I want to listen." Mm. I, like he said, "How many of you wanted to listen to her talk?" And mm. they all like were like, "Oh." And I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah. And um, after that, I like, think that like marked me and marked my heart because in every single little face that I was looking at of those mm. kids, I was seeing my kids. Mm. To me as a mother, and, and I'm blessed and, and incur- I'm, I'm grateful to be called Mama King. You know, I have lots of spiritual children. But I think when you're going into those settings and they are, they have made so many poor choices. How do you... I mean, I know it's through the spirit, but there's still some, there's still some of your consciousness in it. Like, how do you meet them? How do you love them where they are? Because I feel like that's the part that the body is missing. We're not loving people in their brokenness well. Well, um, one of the first things that we ask when we go there is like, how many of them got their fathers in their lives? Mm. So, like, we do know that that missing space creates anger. And I tell you this because I was one of them. Mm-hmm. And I pick up and identify with them with, with them like this. 
and even like there there's moments and have been moments that um we kind of click with these kids and then um maybe a month after the kid went out the jail and he got shot yeah. he got killed and it happened to us like three times already wow. and it's really hard wow. um you know with that said i would love in the future for us to sit down with you and talk about your story um i know you both bring a lot to the table um could you could you tell me your ministry now how has that changed your personal lives and your families it has uh, drawn us closer to god you know every time we're almost every day we're in a jail or or a prison or or, or ministering online or on the street so you got to mm-hmm. prepare for it what about your kids how do they receive this Though, i mean what are their thoughts on this how well, do they we got two daughters that sing on the worship team at church Amen. Uh, when we go out, they're ready to come with us. Uh, I think the last cup of cup of coffee video we did, we did with with my son Justin. Nice. <laughs> you know, we're trying to uh, get them more motivated. You said that you have to prepare. What does preparation look like for the ministry work that you're doing? Because I know I can only imagine the attacks and the resistance that you are enduring as a in a marriage and then through, through your family but fasting a lot of fasting praying uh you know just eating the word of god daily you know falling on our faces daily killing that flesh daily you know god god put us together we're, we're one when we come together right so i mean you got to be on one accord that's right and it's funny how we go to the people that is in need and like we People think we're gonna go minister them, and they minister us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, so I know that uh, we can go on forever, mm-hmm. and you guys have a beautiful story, and you guys have an awesome testimony, both of you, and and I love what God has done in your life. You guys are amazing, and I thank you, you know, um, for just taking the time out of your busy schedules to come down here to to sit down with us and to share your story. Um, I, and, and I know there's so much more that we haven't shared, but is there one thing that we haven't talked about that you, like, what is your message to everyone? Like, if there's one thing that you could share with people listening. Don't throw in, don't throw in the towel. You know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people nowadays, even, you know, Christians are ready just to, to give up, you know, not continue mm-hmm. fighting a good fight. Uh, you know, don't don't throw in the towel. At the end of the day, God is still on the throne. Mm-hmm. He's still in control. Uh, he didn't throw in the towel on us, so why throw in the towel on him? Amen. I was thinking, I was just say like, don't give up. I know there's many difficult things in life about being a parent, about having a relationship, about work, mm-hmm. everything. But there's nothing that God doesn't put in your life by mistake. If you're going through it, it's because he's preparing you for something. That's right. And I think it's hard for everyone to come to the place where we have to, at some point, just surrender. You know, we have, you know, coming back from dealing with prisoners in the past, it was always about me having control of the situation, you know, controlling my environment. And it wasn't until God stepped into my life and showed me that uh, I can't control my environment. And when I try to control it, it doesn't always work my way. So I have to get to the point where I have to be okay with knowing that he's going to take care of me and surrendering to him, controlling whatever he has for me because it's going to be good no matter what. It's just that human part of us that um, that makes us think that we have to control it, that if we don't have part in it, it is not going to be right. And that's not the case. That's just the enemy trying to trick us, right? We are saved by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And testimony has been a big part like the worst, the more, the more dramatic and the more crazy the testimony, then I will believe. Okay, God can really save me. <laughs> he saved them. He could save me. But I, I just want to say I thank you for sharing your testimony because it is through your testimony that you're giving people hope mm-hmm. that God could do that for you, and yeah. you He could do it for me. And so I just want to make sure that. And don't forget about me, Lydia. No, but of course, <laughs> of course. 
But I, I just wanted to, I just feel in my spirit that we have to pray for them. I really feel like what the Lord wants to do through them individually, their marriage, their children, the Lord has been working miracles in their children. I just, I feel if you are watching this and you are a believer, uh, we need to be lifting up those that are going. You know, everybody's not called to go into these these areas, but if they are called, they need to be lifted up by the body. And so I just want to encourage people watching to lift up their marriage, lift up their minds, to lift up their children, to lift up their finances, uh, because this is a sacrifice and God is good. He, he does it. But man, when we come together as brothers and sisters and we lift each other up, God can really be glorified in it. And so I just really want to encourage somebody who's watching to lift you up because I'll be praying for you guys. Amen. Amen. We'll be praying Thank for you. you as well. Amen. Thank you. Um, so as we finish off, I just, you know, um, I want to thank my wife for supporting me with this, my brother-in-law, Greg, and everybody else that has um, just prayed for me today. With that said, would you do me the honor to pray? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne, Lord, with thanksgiving and praise. We thank you, Lord, for your love, your grace, and your mercy, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for this divine appointment, Lord. We thank you for these men and women of God, Father, that you have brought into our lives, Lord God, for your honor and for your glory. We thank you for this podcast, Lord God, and we just pray that whatever uh, vision they have, Lord God, that you will just expand it, Father God, nationwide, Lord God. Uh, we just uh, lift up to you every single man and woman here in this room, Lord God. We pray for their families. We plead the blood of Jesus over their lives, Lord God. We plead the blood of Jesus over their ministry, Lord God, and we just pray that you continue to use them, Lord God. For your honor, for your glory, Father God. We, we, we want no pat on the back. We want no glory. We just want your son, Jesus, to be glorified. Your kingdom to be glorified, Father God. And that souls will come to the feet of your son, Jesus, Lord God. We love you and we thank you, Father. We give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. I want to thank you for thinking about us and for inviting us. Thank you, Lydia. And thank you for always making us feel as family. You are family. We <laughs> love you guys. Thank you. Great job. All right. All right. Thank you. You guys are amazing. Uh, <laughs> he started with his tears and then I, I tag along. <laughs> My God. I told you. Did I tell you? Tears give other people permission yes. to have this. Thanks for watching that video. I hope that you liked it and you subscribed to the YouTube channel. We want to thank you for your support. If you want to know more of the work that we're doing, we are working on creating a quarterly newsletter. Not only that's sharing who we're working with, some of the work that we're called to here in the States and throughout the Caribbean, but we're also getting you connected in ways that you can serve. And so we want you to go to our website, www.one, the number one, oneloveunited.org. There you can sign up for the newsletter, stay in contact with us, and, and pray with us because we need it.